Okay. That one would just stay there, yeah. Okay. Bueno, pues muchas gracias por venir. Vamos a empezar. Ojalá pueda llegar más gente. Este, tenemos hoy el gusto de tener con nosotros a la profesora Cristina Sormani, que viene de la CUNY en Nueva York y Lehman College. Y es una líder en el área de geometría diferencial y tiene muchos trabajos fundamentales acerca de este tema de convergencia de variedades rimanianas. Y es un tema muy activo del que también tendremos una mini conferencia el viernes que entra con este, otros tres ponentes y esta es como una introducción más panorámica y esperamos que, que pues, les guste. Gracias por venir. Thank you very much. Gracias por la invitación. Uh, mi español es muy mal, so I'll speak in English for the talk. <laughs> um, okay, so I will also speak about metric spaces as well as Riemannian manifolds. So there's three notions. Of convergence, where we have a sequence, um, where we have a sequence of manifolds M J, sorry, J going to some M infinity, and these could be espaciosmetricos uh, or Riemannian manifolds. Either way, um, and the first notion is called Lipschitz convergence. which um, is a pretty old version. Uh, then there is uh, gromov hausdorff convergence. Which was introduced by Gromov. This, some people would say it's chiga gromov although they don't actually credit themselves. And then there is intrinsic flat convergence. Which is joint with me and Stefan Wenger, who was a postdoc at NYU when we worked together. And so I'm going to tell you about these three notions of convergence and various compactness theorems. And I'll try to draw lots of pictures so you get a good feel for all three of them. So we say MJ Lipschitz converges to M infinity. The MJs and M infinity can just be metric spaces. Or they could be Riemannian manifolds. So it's espacios metricos or variety as Riemannians. Okay, so the you have this when the Lipschitz distance between MJ and M infinity goes to zero, where Lipschitz distance between two spaces x and y, one and x two is equal to the infimum over all Lipschitz maps of the, um, the log dil f comma log dil, oh, plus I think, plus log dil f inverse. The infimum is all over all f from x1 to x2 which are by Lipschitz, and the dill of f is the supremum over all x in x1 of the distance in x2 between f x, f y, this is y in x1, x not equal to y. Okay, so this, see, this notion, 
requires that we actually have by Lipschitz maps that run between the two spaces. So in particular, the spaces have to have the same shape. So this convergence works if, for example, you're looking at, um, let me just, this is your M1, M2, and they'll, Lipschitz converge just a sphere. So that that works well for those. But it does not work. It also works for another example would be um, have something like this with boundaries. So this is Okay, so the whole sequence, they're all by Lipschitz maps between each one in the sequence, and the distances are getting closer and closer. There's very little change in distance. If you could have M1 with boundary, here boundary M1 is this outside edge, you only have Lipschitz convergence if they start becoming nicer. So these ones all have boundary, and this is going to a disk. Everything is almost the same shape with this notion of convergence. It does not work. We have no lip convergence. If you have, say, a sequence of tori, this is T2, equal to S1 cross S1, and you make them thinner and thinner. So let's make this um, 1 over J1. So get a sequence of tori. This has no lip limit. That's our M1. This side identifies this. But we would kind of like to say that has a limit. And another um, example with no Lipschitz convergence is if we had our bump and then the second one has a thinner bump. And this has no lip limit. OK, so the bump is getting too thin, so we don't have any notion for these are not getting close to each other by Lipschitz. They're not close. All right, so we want another notion. So we should introduce a new idea. So now we're going to talk about the Grom of Hausdorff distance. GH is Grom of Hausdorff. And then the idea with the Gromov Hausdorff distance is we would like this sequence to have some limits. So we want this to have a li limit. And we want this one to have a limit. And so what Gromov decided is what would be the right limit for this? So he looks at it and he says, he feels that if these tori are getting thinner and thinner, there should be a limit that lost a dimension. He wants the limit to be S1. And he would like the limit of this guy to be a sphere with a line segment attached. So the limits 
are metric spaces. And that's his plan. So in order to make his definition, he can't have a map F. There will not be any map F that goes from here to here. There's no map. There's no inverse map. So we need to make a new notion. So the reason he calls it Gorman Hausdorff is he builds upon an old existing notion. Ah, uh, not racing well. Can you see the red? That sort of holes? Okay. So um, the gromov hausdorff distance between two spaces is equal to the infimum of the Hausdorff distance inside some space Z of images and the infimum is taken over all compact metric spaces Z All distance preserving maps phi i from xi to z. And this is the Hausdorff distance where dh z between two sets. This is the Hausdorff distance. In Z. The Hausdorff distance in Z is an older notion, and it says that this is the infimum over all radii such that A1 is in the tubular neighborhood radius R around A2, and A2 is in the tubular neighborhood radius R around A1. a neighborhood about a radius A is all the points X such that there exists A and A distance from A is less than R. Okay, so it's a tubular neighborhood around the set. And distance preserving means um, if you have two points here, the distance afterwards is the same as the distance before. So that's distance preserving. So this is Gromov's Gromov Hausdorff distance. And when you use this method, you could look again at the sequence, and he's saying, take your space and your limit space and put them together into some z. So we want to compare him and him sitting inside a larger z. So if I make my z here, my one space could look like this. That's my m1. And I map him into z. He looks almost the same as he did before. And then the limit space by infinity, m infinity, if we call this guy m infinity. So we make them both sit inside some z, and then we want to measure the distance between these two guys sitting inside z. So we want to put it as close together inside z as we can. So we put them really close, and then we measure two of the neighborhoods around them. And so we estimate. If this is z, they're sitting in z, the tubular neighborhood around him reaches all the way to here, and that would be the distance, and then to get from the tubular neighborhood around him to include all of him. So we take these large tubular neighborhoods around each one, and then this is giving my estimate r. which then estimates the gromov hausdorff distance. So the gromov hausdorff distance between this guy and this guy is almost the whole length. And then the gromov hausdorff distance between this one and this one is this. And it's getting smaller and smaller. OK? And for these, the same sort of thing. You put them in the same space. For this set, we could actually use, 
uz equal R, e, R2 and just put them together in the, inside R2. Here's my phi one, M, phi infinity m infinity. It's just a disk. And then that guy, my phi j m j, and my gromov hausdorff distance is going to, he's sitting inside here, so the gromov hausdorff distance is really measured just from this radius here. So you're fitting them inside a common z. These guys are all flat. If they're flat, these are all just flat sets. They're all just flat, fine distance preserving maps that put them inside flat Euclidean space, and then you just measure the R distance here. The R distance is getting small because he's almost round. For these, the common z that we would use would be to put this guy inside M1 himself. So for this one, we could use So if I want M1 is just himself, OK? So that's my Z. This is the M infinity phi infinity m infinity, and the radius that's needed is about this long. And that's the gromov hausdorff distance. So when it's getting thinner, this radius gets very small. So again, gromov hausdorff distance gets small. And then for this one and this one, it's a little hard to draw the space, but you can sort of picture a higher dimensional space coming out here. And then you have the long, thin tube near it. So if you wanted to imagine the Z here, I can't actually draw it again. It's sort of something vague. My, my limit guy here, and then my sample who's close to the limit. And you can see the radius is, along, is about that size. But the if I tried to show it was Grom of Hausdorff close to an ordinary sphere, the radius would be very large. OK, so that's Grom of Hausdorff convergence. And gromov hausdorff convergence works very well for sequences that have the following conditions. So Gromov's compactness if your MJs have a uniform upper bound on diameter, And um, the number of disjoint balls radius r is less than or equal to uniform n r. This does not depend on j. Does not depend on j. Then a subsequence. MJK has a gromov hausdorff limit, M infinity, and this is a metric space. And if these have Alexandrov curvature bounds, then he'll have Alexandrov curvature bounds. And if he has Ricci curvature bounds, then this space has metric measure bounds. So for the last part, to say the nice properties of M infinity, you can add, um, involves more authors. So you have um, Gromov, let's just say Chiga Calding. So the ebb infinity is uh, something called if you also have a Ricci for the whole sequence, j greater than or equal to some negative h naught and volume greater than v1, v naught greater than zero. So we say if it's non, this is called non-collapsing, and if the Ricci curvature is greater than negative h, then your m infinity is 
identifiable with the same dimension, so you don't lose dimension. So that's an important work of Cheeger and Holding that they said, okay, let's look at these limit spaces. And they all know boundary M infinity is empty. Okay, so without boundary, you won't end up with situations like collapsing. So this picture's up there. That one has collapsing for the whole thing. It collapsed to a, to a circle. And the second one, part of it collapsed. Those things don't happen if you have the Ritchie bound. Actually, you know. So now what if, you're, what if boundary MJ is not empty? So those situations, if the boundary MJ is not empty, you can have some um, situations where you have this uh, Ritchie, Ritchie J greater than to say zero, something flat even. Let's just make it completely flat. And the volume is bounded below, but, the, but you can have some troubles. So put that Gromov showed. With boundary MJ, boundary M empty, that Ritchie greater equal to zero implies all the sequence, the number of uh, disjoint balls was uh, less than or equal to nr with a precise formula. So Gromov showed that when the boundary m is empty, you have this um, with n diameter, sorry. But if, the, if it has boundary, this is false with boundary. False if mj have boundary mj not equal to And so there's two pictures I can draw for that situation. And I think I'll draw them here. Let's just take some flat, flat manifolds. So one will be our sequence of flowers. Th these are described in detail in joint work with Perales. So you can ask her more about it. Um, you have flowers. So flowers look like this. Um, the first one in the sequence could maybe have not so many. And then the second one, look like that. And then the third. OK, these are all flat. So you can cut them out of paper. And you have the sequence here, flat space. With the so Ritchie is greater than zero, they're actually flat, so it's zero curvature. And then because of these extra bumps, we're not going to be able to count the number of balls because every one of these bumps gives us a new ball. We have increasingly many balls. The, the distance from a point over here, if I take this point and I want to travel, I have to go down to here and then back up to get to a point. So this ball around this point is of this radius one, say, is this joint from this ball. 
we're inside the manifold, and we're not going outside from the boundary. So we have the sequence of flat manifolds, and this has no GH limit. Lost my orange. Right there. No GH limit. And the other sequence of examples is. Um, oh, but notice that they have a uniform upper bound and diameter, right? Diameter, say, is less than or equal to 5 for all of them. And if that's 1, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, well, 10. And Ritchie is actually equal to zero for the whole sequence. So these guys have the conditions, but with, because of the boundary having so much curvature, they have no gromov hauser limit. And then the other such um, example we have, we call them foils. And what they are is the first one is an annulus inside Euclidean space, inner radius 1. Oh, sorry. This is a 1 and this is a 3, say. OK? And we're looking at this as our space. That's our space. And then the second one is a double cover of, now I make the inner radius 1 half. And the outer radius is still 3. And then we have a triple cover of now it's 1 third, and so on. OK, so double cover means you go up and you have two copies of it, and they spiral around and back. And this one has three copies, and then attach. Okay. So this, what they sort of look like is that this looks like, looks kind of like that shape. And this one is oscillating even more. And they're flat. You can build these. And actually, in our paper, we have photographs of them. We built them. OK? I think my kids built them. And then the first one is just plain. Okay, so what happens here is that the outer edges of these guys, this edge is 6 pi, right? And so this edge is 6 pi. And the inner edge is 2 pi. And so this inner edge is 2 pi. For this one, the outer edge is 6 pi again. But the double cover, the outer edge is 12 pi. The inner edge of this one is only pi. The inner edge of this guy is, again, 2 pi. Double the pi. The inner edge of this one is 2 pi over 3. So the triple cover's inner edge is pi again for the whole sequence. And so when you look at this sequence, you end up with estimating the diameter Estimate the diameter in red. The diameter between any point here and any point here, you just go to the center, around, and out. So for all of this whole sequence, the diameter of all these foils is less than or equal to, well, that's at most 3 plus 3 plus, um, sorry, did I say pi? I should have said 2 pi here. 2 pi. plus 2 pi. So that's less than or equal to a uniform bound. And again, they are flat. So the Ricci j equals 0. And these have no limit, no GH limit. Because again, we can make lots of balls that are disjoint. So you can draw a ball here. And he lifts to one copy. But if I draw the same size ball here, he has two copies. And I lift the ball here, I'm going to have three copies. One, two, three. 
So the number of balls is going up. We don't have that uniform balance in the number of balls. So there's this norm of Hausdorff limit. Just. So there's a nice theorem anyway, luckily. So nevertheless, Raquel proves the theorem. Which orange? So what if the boundary is not zero? Perales has a theorem which says that if um, uh, you have the Ricci mj's bigger than or equal to zero and volume mj's less than or equal to v and diameter mj deltas, I'll explain that in a second, less than or equal to d, and it's non-collapsing, which means we're avoiding, just like Cheeger holding, they're also non-collapsing. This is the volume down to below thing. Okay, and the non-collapsing and Activity radius of the boundary. Is bigger than equal to some I know it, bigger than zero. And then the subsequence. Mj k g h converges to m infinity, and m infinity is rectifiable. in the same dimension. So that's the situation. Cheeger Kolding extended without the boundary. So the extra parts, you notice Cheeger Kolding only needed, they had just a dimension. <laughs> the big difference that she has to add is this extra volume bound and this. So I'll explain the extra, the, those two conditions are both coming up from here. She needs the extra volume bound is um, this sequence has nicely controlled injectivity rates of the boundary. The boundaries, you know, there's plenty of room around the boundaries pointing inward. So these have nice injectivity radius, but the volume is going to infinity. So. The uh, foils example, foils fail because volume goes to infinity. These volume, this, this, this one's volume is close to the volume of, this is of a disk, this is close to the volume of a double disk. This is almost the volume of three times a disk and so on. Their volume is going to infinity. So that's why she needs this volume condition. And um, the injectivity radius condition is needed for this. This one has the volume bound. All of these have a good bound on their volume. But the inject you can't, uh, your geodesics start crashing into each other in the petals. So the foils, the flowers fail. Fail the inject rad. She has um, many theorems with different conditions, but this is the easiest one to state, um, where she puts different conditions on the boundaries and things. Um, but this one is the easiest, and it has these two very beautiful examples that she can do. So this is Raquel Perales' work. She's right there. So then you might say, are there examples that still fail? So are there examples out there that actually have no limit even, um, oh, sorry. The next thing we want to ask is, is there hope for sequences which 
uh, have no Grumman Hausdorff limit. So let me give you an example from Ilmanen. That's a clean board so I can. So you might say that the um, Lipschitz convergence was designed for sectional curvature and the gromov hausdorff was designed for Ricci curvature. And then if you only have a scalar curvature bound, what can you do? So what if MJ has scalar gradient equal to zero, not rich gradient equal to zero? The scalar curvature is, is the trace of the Ricci. Okay, it's a, it's a trace. So saying scalar gradient equal to zero is much weaker than Ricci gradient equal to zero. So what if you have only that? And so Ilmanen had an example that he was very upset about. So these are three dimensional with scalar gradient equal to zero. Actually, they're strictly gradient equal to zero. And his examples, they are all spheres. And the first one maybe has one bump. And the second one has two bumps. And the third one has three bumps. But let's make them thinner. I want to make them very thin. This sequence has scalar greater than zero, and the also going to be bounded above. Bounded below. And their diameters are all bounded. But there's no GH limit. So these can have scalar gradient equal to zero because although it looks like negative curvature here, there's a positive curvature. So the well is going up like this. This is negative, but this direction is around. Directions are positive. One direction is positive. They're done well. Okay. So he makes a sequence like this, and they have no Gromov Hausdorff limit because again, I could take a ball around this one, and then there's two balls that are disjoint here, and this one has three disjoint balls. So they end up not being close to Gromov Hausdorff, no Gromov Hausdorff limit. And he said, well, he wanted the limit to be S3. Standard metric. But we can't use Gromov Hausdorff, we can't use Lipschitz. There's no Lipschitz limit. So now what can we do? So that's when we come to intrinsic flat. So we introduced intrinsic flat conversion to handle this. So this is joint work with Stefan Wenger from about 10 years ago. And so we say MJ, M, these have to be oriented Riemannian manifolds. Converge to M infinity M. In the intrinsic flat sense, which is a big fancy F. 
if intrinsic flat distance sorry, between m1 and m2 goes to 0. And the intrinsic flat distance between two spaces, sorry, mj, m infinity. This is the intrinsic flat distance between mj and m infinity. It's going to be very different from the gromov hausdorff distance. So here, the gromov hausdorff distance said, take in femum distances. So we're going to also take an infimum. So we'll take an infimum of flat distances. Sorry. Z up, F down. Between images. Over all complete Z. And phi i from M i to Z. Distance preserving. But we didn't use Hausdorff distance, this flat distance. Where the flat, the Federer Fleming flat distance. Is the distance between things inside Z, the flat distance in Z between two things. They're always submanifolds. And they're always oriented. And it's basically equal to the infimum of the volume plus one plus the volume AM. Such that boundary B plus A is phi 1 M1 minus phi 2 M2. So this is saying, I'll just draw in a second. Ah, I got too close to the edge. Here is your M1. Here's your M2. And what A does. A makes it into a closed cycle. It has two parts in this picture. Now it's a closed cycle. And B fills it in with something one dimension higher. That's B. He's one dimension higher. So we're saying the boundary of B is M1, M2, and these two little pieces. So this distance here is very different from the gromov hausdorff distance because now instead of measuring a radius between the two spaces, we're measuring volumes between them. So when you measure volumes between spaces, things end up coming out very differently. Oh, I'm going to hope I can bring down that one. Yes. Let me see. I might have a picture I can talk about right away. So for this sequence, which I should have erased, for this sequence that we had here, and we talked about putting them into a common Z. But now, when we put them in a common Z, we would, put, we would measure the volume of the region in between them. Not a radius, but a volume. Or for this one, if we want to estimate the intrinsic flat distance, we put them into this common Z, and we're estimating not this radius, but the volume of the region in between. I should use a different color. This picture is really hard to see. This one, we took one of the guys from the sequence, and he looked like this. And the last guy in the sequence was this. And now, if we wanted to measure the Gromov-Hausdorff distance, it was this radius. And if we want to measure 
the intrinsic flat distance, it's this volume. Okay, so both of these, as you can see, the volume will get small as it gets closer. But then, for a picture like this one, we took the sequence guys and we put them in common space and we put the limit as the radius between them. But this one has no sense of volume between them because the limit space is not the same dimension. So actually, if you look at it, you notice in this case that the volume of the MJs is going to zero. So we said that the flat limit is the zero space. It disappears because the volume itself is going to zero. The volume between it and a single point is going to zero. So the volume between it and an empty set is zero. So we say that flat goes to zero space. But what happens with this sequence is that the flat limit, well, I have to measure the volume between this guy and what I want my flat limit to be. My flat limit is just the sphere because this volume is small. So the flat limit is just the sphere. That part disappeared. And so we, we lost that part because this volume is between phi 1, m1, phi 2, m2, close to 0. So part of it disappeared. And this one, the whole thing disappeared. And now for the Ilman in one, this is actually the flat limit. Because the volumes inside these tubes is going to zero. Once there's a uniform upper bound on the volume, the ordinary volume, but remember B is one dimension higher. So it's the filling volume. So the filling volume between this sphere and all of these is going to zero. And so this actually has an intrinsic flat limit that's a sphere, but it has no gromov hausdorff limit at all. In fact, there's a very nice theorem. So also in the joint work with Wenger, we showed that if the MJ's gromov hausdorff converge to some M infinity, to some space X, and the volumes of the MJ's is less than or equal to V naught, and the volume of the boundaries is less than or equal to A naught, then a subsequence converges in the flat sense to some m infinity who is inside x is a subset. And that exactly matches the situation here where the flat limit is a subset of the gromov hausdorff limit. The flat limit is a subset of this gromov hausdorff limit. We also show that the limit spaces, even without this, the limit spaces of any MJ that flat converge to some M infinity are always rectifiable. Or they're the zero, or the zero space. Rectifiable means it's by Lipschitz charts that cover it, not just, they're by Lipschitz maps that cover almost everything. 
Okay? So there we have that the limit spaces of anything that's a flat limit, they always end up rectifiable. They have a notion of orientation or zero space. In fact, we call them integral current spaces. And anything in that class of spaces, we can define intrinsic flat convergence. So we can't define intrinsic flat convergence for arbitrary metric spaces, but we can for these things called integral current spaces, which are rectifiable, correct dimension. They have a boundary that's rectifiable, so they have a notion of boundary, and they have a notion of what's called a mass, which is like a volume. And these are based on the integral currents of Federer Fleming. And um, don't have time to write it here, but Raquel, um, Perales, Catherine Searle, Marie Jaramillo, Anna Siffert, and I'm going to forget one. Who's the last one? Ra oh, Priyanka Raj. Okay, the, the, the five of them prove that if you have an Alexandrov space that's oriented, it's in this class of integral current spaces. So you can also talk about their intrinsic flat limits. All right, and they use the work of Barago Gromov Perelman to help prove that and also some other people. Okay, so this is um, the, the, the world of intrinsic flat limits, but then the natural question is, when are intrinsic flat limits equal to gromov hausdorff limits? So usually it's a subset. So the next question is, when is m infinity equal to x? When do they actually agree? Because if you can prove that they agree, then you've just shown the gromov hausdorff limit is rectifiable, which ordinarily you don't have work. So anytime you can do this, you, this, um, this is a way of proving the GH limit is rectifiable. In fact, it's the method used by Raquel with the boundary case. Okay, so she, when she did the boundary case with the Ritchie bounds, she used the, the, she proved the intrinsic flat limits agreed with the gromov hausdorff limits. I think I still have her board here. This theorem, actually, she gets flat and huge convergence, the same limit space in her theorem here. So actually, with Wenger, we proved this without boundary. So the same theorem without boundary. Um, is in a different paper I wrote with Wenger. It's not the same paper there. And, and uh, so we also need the non-collapsing because if it collapses, that's when it goes to zero. Um, we had to, we don't have to the volume because Ritchie and the diameter upper bound implies the volume upper bound. So we have the same theorem with, um, in our paper. And then um, Madveyev in Portuguese recently extended the non-boundary, boundary MJ is empty, but Ritchie is allowed to have a negative lower bound. Okay? And so they got the result that the Gromov Hausdorff and flat limits agree. In that setting as well. How much time? Five minutes. Okay. So I'll just say one tiny more thing. Because um, I basically said everything, but I just want to give you a hint about something that's sort of of interest, which is or maybe I'll just say it out loud. There's something called tetrahedral property, which says that the spaces contain tetrahedra that are forced not to flatten. They're just stiff like this. And so um, Portuguese and I.
tetrahedra look kind of like this. If the spaces have this tetraprop, MJ with tetraprop, the subsequence flat equal GH converges. And it's kind of a neat thing because it's a description that doesn't use any of the old notions of curvature. It's just about collections of points having certain distance relationships, which is kind of like Alexandrov geometry, but Alexandrov geometry only uses triangles, and this is using a higher dimension. And it's important that it doesn't collapse because collapsing would be the zero case. So this is preventing collapse, this tetrahedral property. And then um, Raquel Perales and Jesus Nunez Perales it's Dunez and Braun, right? I know, you should go first. <laughs> okay. I'll just put an and. They, they, they noticed that this tetrahedral property was too stiff and it doesn't fit into a long skinny cone. So they made a tetrahedral property that allows for very thin tetrahedra <laughs> that could fit in cones. And this allows a larger class of spaces. And for that larger class of spaces, they also prove a subsequence flat equal GH converges. So they get the same theorem with a more flexible tetrahedral property. It doesn't allow them to become arbitrarily thin, because that would be collapsing, but it allows this. So one of the current projects that Raquel Perales and I are looking at is what, are, what would be the classes and properties of such limit spaces. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this fascinating panoramic view of, of all of these fields. Uh, ¿Tienen alguna pregunta? ¿Alguien quisiera preguntar? Uh, 